Ready to start? Can, you, can everyone hear me? Yeah, cool. All right, so uh, thanks very much for coming to this. Um, just to give you an introduction to what we're going to talk about, we've called it Death and Taxes, because um, we're going to talk a bit about why you should always plan for the worst uh, in your infrastructure, but also because actually we only just adopted using an OpenStack IS provider, and I think if we didn't, we would have been totally screwed about three months ago. Um, so that's kind of a bit of the story. So a bit about why we've gone on to OpenStack and a bit of a story about how it saved us from a lot of trouble. So my name's Tim Britton. I'm the product owner for the digital platform at HMRC. And this is uh, Phil. He's one of the DevOps consultants which helped us deliver this project in our web operations team. So uh, for those of you who don't know who HMRC are, I don't normally have to kind of introduce my organization because people kind of boo at this point. Um, but we're the, uh, the basically the English version of the IRS. Uh, for a private sector kind of analogy, I always think of ourselves as a big insurance company because we take money off people and don't give them anything back uh, and then occasionally have to pay them something. Now, one thing to bear in mind ahead of this talk is that we have incredibly seasonal traffic, so driven by the tax legislation in the UK. So on the 31st of January, we have every single person in the UK who is self-employed having to pay and having to file and then pay their uh, self-assessment tax return. Uh, and I think around sort of 90% of those people do it online. So I'm going to go way back to kind of give you an introduction to this story. Um, HMRC has previously had a pretty bad reputation for delivering digital services and generally IT. Um, so back in 2010, uh, across government, there was a kind of move to try and find out why we weren't producing the digital services which were seen in the private sector. And the British government commissioned a lady called Martha Lane Fox to go away and write an open letter back to government as to what we should do to change this. She went away for six months, had a look around, and she came back with this idea that we needed revolution, not evolution. So our services, we were pretty much, in HMRC especially, obsessed with kind of waterfall deliveries. We had a huge amount of governance. Um, excuse me. And we had uh, a massive amount of outsourcing. So everything in HMRC was outsourced. Now, we were probably the worst in some respects for some of these departments because we had previously had a bit of a data breach, which meant that our governance made it impossible to make any changes. We had six-month release cycles, and we would have like, huge and huge amounts of change on one weekend of, or two weekends of the year. Uh, and, and if you went, did something wrong or you had a bit of content wrong on the page, you wouldn't be able to get that in until six months later. So that's the kind of picture that we were, we were looking at in 2010. So the one thing that she came back with as an idea was to uh, create a new department, um, the Government Digital Service, which had a single mandate to revolutionize digital services. Now, this is a new department which was connected to Cabinet Office, which is probably the uh, most powerful, uh, politically, politically most powerful office in uh, government under the Treasury. And they came in, they were basically hired, not from within the civil service, but externally from private sector. And they came up with a really, really good set of principles about how we should deliver digital services in government. So there was an emphasis on multidisciplinary teams, agile principles, a massive focus on user needs. Um, and also at the end of, of one of the key things they came up with, and something you can read about online, is whenever you want to put something uh, online in government, you have to go to GDS and be assessed against those, their design principles before you're allowed to go into production. So they started off this program called the 25 Exemplars. Uh, this was basically uh, 25 pilot projects which would be delivered with these, um, these sort of principles, and three of those were in HMRC. Now, the reason there was such a high proportion in HMRC is because we actually are responsible for 50% of all transactions with the uh, British government. Um, so faced with these deliveries, at the time we had this very, very archaic sort of setup for delivering services. So we realized that actually the only way we we're going to do this is if we kind of built a new department within HMRC which was not within any of the confines of the current organization. So we had, we didn't use any of the corporate networks. We went out, we bought MacBooks, you know, we brought in people from the outside. Uh, and we started quite a small skunk works to basically deliver these three services. And at the time, this was like absolutely awesome because you had unlocked laptops, like we were running around, we got to talk to users, stuff that we'd never done before. And we were delivering services in-house. 
And we got really, really excited. Um, we got really excited about working in an agile way. And I think at the time, we kind of got a little bit too excited about all the functionality of the building. We kind of forgot about infrastructure. Uh, there were some other things involved as well, but infrastructure certainly took a back seat because the business doesn't really generally tend to get excited about infrastructure when they are seeing the, the demos of like the new screens coming through. So um, we did the typical thing. This is kind of around 2013, just to give you an idea of the timeline. So we did the typical thing is uh, we kind of forgot about it for a while, and then we suddenly had to scramble for uh, IS supplier. Um, at the time, we, uh, government has a very sort of particular view about what suppliers you can use. We can't like whack out a credit card and go onto AWS. Um, the British government are pretty stringent about um, what you can do with data, and so are the British public. So we were kind of restricted to trying to find a cloud supplier who um, could provide us with what we needed and the availability we needed, uh, but also wasn't US-based. So typically, the, actually, one company kind of filled a niche in that respect, uh, a, VM, a VMware uh, IS supplier, and we kind of um, basically put all of our chips on them. 2013, the only place we could build infrastructure, so we started off and we, uh, we kind of... Um, yeah, so we kind of were in a position where we, we didn't really have very much time. So we had three services. These are the three services on the outside. This is kind of a look at, at how we were shaped organizationally. We started to, we were so rushed to kind of build this infrastructure. We had all this work that uh, was kind of shared components that all of these three services would use. And we needed kind of a name to call that work. And we, and we just thought, we'll call it the tax platform. We didn't really know what that meant at the time. Uh, and we didn't think of it as a PaaS or anything. We just had to build stuff. And we had to be efficient with our time because we, didn't, we, couldn't really, we couldn't afford to diversify in terms of services. So we built a shared infrastructure. We'd already chosen to have um, microservice architecture running in Docker containers. But we didn't really, at this point, think you know, this is going to get that much bigger. So anyway, we managed to, get, managed to scramble some uh, infrastructure together, get these services live. and. They're really, really successful because they're the first like, digital services that we've put out which actually went in front of a user before we put them into production. So the business are like, this is awesome. You know, this is the first time we've actually had people saying good things about our services. That's a bit harsh, but you know. Um, and so they typically put loads and loads of money behind it, right? So then we have, you know, we have people phoning us up going, yeah, by the way, we're going to set up a delivery center in Newcastle that's going to have 20 agile teams. So you're going from like, Three, we went to five, and then suddenly, bam, we went to 20. And then someone phones up again and goes, by the way, we're setting up another delivery center in Telford, which is in the Midlands of the UK, and they're going to have another 20 teams. So at this point, we're like totally sort of, you know, desperately trying to scale this massive uh, amount of teams, this massive amount of functionality, and we realize that we're not going to be able to, we, we, we're kind of forced in the position where we have to build a PaaS, like a, a platform which allows teams to very quickly stand up and very quickly deliver good digital services. So we managed to do that, but remember we're still again on one IS supplier, and we and we start to, uh, we struggle. But you know, there's, it's kind of a different presentation to talk about how we got through those struggles. But we managed to build a platform which, you know, provided us with the things that we needed. Um, we did a lot of uh, used pretty much predominantly open source technologies, and Phil will talk about that in a second. And also we tried to open source as much of our code as possible. So if you go to GitHub com forward slash HMRC, you'll see that you can find pretty much all of our code. Um, and we got to this position where instead of being this kind of like skunk works in a small building, we were actually slowly becoming the main, like, the main people in HMRC who had to deliver or, or run and operationally run services for the UK government's tax authority. On sort of this slide, you know, we could go down and people wouldn't really matter because those things aren't totally essential to the UK um, tax authority. Now, when we get to this point in 2015, we start to realize that actually uh, it's all getting a bit serious now. And if we fall over, like the country starts to lose money, which is pretty worrying. Um, and it's only really in October 15 that they really started to kind of, the business really said, OK, you guys have been successful. Uh, we're going to put all payments, so every single, like every single online uh, method by which you could pay HMRC, so the UK government for your tax, was moved onto the tax platform. Also, 
the only way in which you could file your self-assessment was moved onto the tax platform, previously it being hosted by an incumbent supplier. So we're slowly and, and gradually, incrementally, bringing these services on, and we got to kind of a critical mass in October 2015, and we were like, this is uh, kind of scary, but you know, it's good, but we're still running on one supplier, and we're not getting the availability we need. And kind of to give you an idea about what that means, you know, we're getting like some outages, which previously weren't that worrying because you know, they weren't critical services, but we knew that in January, we'd take something like uh, 150 million in a day uh, on the self-assessment peak. And if you fail, like if you get downtime at that point, uh, things start to happen, which are pretty scary. So if you have to delay the tax deadline, the prime minister and the chancellor have to meet and sign that off. The treasury have to start borrowing money at a rate to cover the, the loss that they've had in the interest. So we're in October and we start to go, this is kind of worrying, we've got to go looking for another, another supply here. Um, and basically, a lot of people I think in this conference, you hear about, you know, there's a lot of people saying, we, we made a really strategic decision to go with OpenStack. And I wish I could say the same, like I had the forethought to be like, yeah, um, took this really strategic decision. But really, we were like, oh my god, we need to find another supplier really, really quickly. They need to be UK based. Uh, so we went out to the market, and we were like, who is around? And we found data centered. Uh, and we kind of, you know, we were like, right, they have a, they, we know that the OpenStack API is really, really versatile. These guys look good. This is our best bet. So we started to try and build out a multi-active or an active-active architecture at that point. So I'm just going to hand over to Phil so you can talk through kind of what the architecture looks like and what that build was like. OK. Thanks, Tim. So October 2015, HMRC is pretty nervous. It's coincidentally, exactly when I joined HMRC. So that's pretty much all I knew was this level of fear. But you know, that's good. If you're building any kind of infrastructure, if you're doing any kind of engineering project, it doesn't matter if it's big or small, it's actually really good to be afraid. It's not good for positive people who say, well, oh, you know, maybe everything's going to be fine. Maybe none of the disks are going to fail. Maybe everything's going to be great. It's not like that. The disks are going to fail. The glass is half empty, and you've got to be pessimistic. And so what does that actually mean? It means you've got to plan for failure. You've got to be resilient against any kind of failure in your system. So it's quite well known that Netflix have got their chaos monkey. If anyone doesn't know about that, it's essentially a bit of software that runs in their infrastructure that just randomly kills stuff. And it happens only during their working hours, which is probably quite sensible, so you don't have to have a call out if it goes wrong. But it essentially means that their engineers get to plan for failure because they absolutely know it's going to happen. It's going to happen all the time. We don't do that, but we build resilience into every part of our stack. Every tier is resilient. We have good stateless microservices. They're running the Heroku type 12 factor apps, resilient Mongo clusters. But most of all, we run virtualized in the cloud no hardware that can possibly fail because the cloud is 100% resilient. <laughs> OK, so some people spotted that that is not true. So the cloud, in fact, it's interesting. So in one of the keynotes, uh, I forget who it was, but someone said it's difficult to explain it to non-technical people. I actually don't think that's true. It's difficult to t explain it to technical people because there is no such thing as the cloud. It's just a data center. I think it's a marketing term. So the thing with, well, it is a marketing term. So <laughs> the thing is, what you're talking about is API-driven data centers. That's what they are with a good advertising team. They're also virtualized. So API-driven virtualized data centers. But they're still running software, still running hardware, and they've still got humans running them. And it's not to blame anyone. You know, All of these things fail. So you've got to plan for it. September last year, 2015, completely unrelated to HMRC, but AWS had a six to eight hour outage. Took out parts of Amazon's own infrastructure, took out Tinder, took out IMDB, and despite the chaos monkey, it took out Netflix. AWS's SLA is 99.95%. That's 20 minutes of outage a month that they can do without having breached their SLA. And the slide that Tim showed us earlier that wouldn't fly. If we had a 20 minute outage during our peak, that would be really bad. If we had a six to eight hour outage, well, people would lose their jobs. It's as simple as that. 
So we don't just need resilience within the DC. We need resilience between suppliers. So our plan to go multi-vendor protects us against the failure of an entire data center, protects us against the failure of the whole supplier. Could be infrastructure bugs, could be human error, could be zero day vulnerabilities, but we should be protected. But there's also business value to going multi data center, and Tim's going to tell you a little bit about that. Yeah, I just think from my perspective, um, right now we run across VMware, we run across OpenStack, and I know that we're not, well, we're tied in, but we know that they can die. So I know that's probably not what you're supposed to say at an OpenStack conference. But if OpenStack as a technology dies, you know, we have some, some insurance against that. If VMware as a technology dies, we have some insurance against that. And as we go to sort of a, um, as we go into the future, we plan to have, you know, three different technologies underlying our infrastructure. So if AWS comes to the UK and we build out and then, you know, we've spread those bets evenly. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what the infrastructure looks like. So essentially what we're doing is we're running a web gateway for people to interface with government for their tax affairs. Requests, first of all, go to CDN, Akamai, before being farmed out to the edge of each provider. And we have a public facing zone. This is full of networks, full of microservices, and Mongo database clusters. Then we have a layer of proxies between that and a protected zone, which is also full of microservices and Mongo clusters. Finally, on the Skyscape side only, that's the VMware provider, we have a private layer. It's more secure processes, and it actually has nothing to do with the customer layer. So we can, we can actually lose that without any interruption to the customer journey. And finally, behind that, we don't actually store any data permanently in the infrastructure. So there's a couple of secure data centers, which are physical data centers, which sit behind there. We link them all up by VPNs, so the Mongo clusters are distributed across and the majority of, oh, sorry, I've gone ahead of myself. And the, uh, you can see the traffic flowing through there. So there's, can't, sorry to interrupt, but no, there's quite an interesting it. bit about this in that I think there's quite a lot of stuff in the keynote talks about this kind of bimodal way of delivering stuff. And really we built, you know, we weren't gonna revolutionize the main, like the main tax systems because they're very varied, they're very old. And the idea is that we kind of build a new infrastructure on top of them, present it as a digital layer, and, you, and build an API, a bunch of APIs from those tax systems, and you, and you gradually strangle them. So you don't try and challenge everything all at once, but you build an API layer which allows you to pull the information you need out bit by bit. And soon you get to the point where actually you have APIs into all of that data, and it's much easier to use. But all the time you're incrementally adding customer value. So I forgot to mention at the beginning of this, yeah. Phil's actually, we've got a bit of a demo, but it runs like half, all the way through the talk. So what he's done is he kicked it off at the beginning. And uh, it's in production, and it's going to route, it's going to change the routing of our traffic between these two and what proportion we're sending to each. And then we're going to show you kind of the impact at the end. Yeah. Okay. So the majority of work on this was done by a small team, four engineers, a little bit of weekend work. We built it, we used vCloud tools, which the government digital service, GDS, that Tim mentioned earlier, they developed that, and Terraform. And because of OpenStack's open APIs, we were able to integrate very quickly, build this out in just four months, and Tim's gonna tell you whether it worked or not. Be a bit of a rubbish presentation if it didn't work. Um, but let me just get... Bear with me two seconds. Right, so I'm just going to give you an idea of the timeline. So we're in, uh, we talked about how we started this in October. We realized normally we'd push infrastructure changes out by going through dev and then seeing if they work, QA, staging, and then into production. But we didn't have time, so we started building out a staging environment. So a new staging environment, which we'd use for, we'd actually have to use for functional testing as well as um, performance testing. And before we'd even finished it, with the timelines that we had, we, we had to start building out the, the production version ready for, um, so we had two teams working in tandem, one working on the kind of still finishing off the proof of concept, then we started building production in both Skyscape and data centers. Um, 
And luckily, well, you know, not luckily, it kind of, we functionally tested it in November and staging, so we didn't abandon the production build. And then on Christmas Eve, which is actually an awesome day to have a full outage if you're the tax authority, because no one does their tax on Christmas Eve, but we had a start of a 48 hour outage of our current production, which was running on one supplier. And so at that point, on sort of Christmas Day and Boxing Day, we had our CIO phoning us up, being like, when can we turn this thing on? Because we're clearly not going to get through this massive business event on January the 30th. Um, and then I think the 12th or 13th of January, we did something I wouldn't recommend to anyone, which is like a massive big bang switch over. So we cut, we turned off all of the tax systems. We replicated all of the data, which was currently in the Mongos, populated the new Mongo clusters, and then we switched everything over. And then we tried to test 40 services. And we had like every QA in HMRC screaming down the phone and Slack being like, I don't know if it works sort of thing. And it was awful, but thankfully, Eventually, everything kind of woke up and sort of we got it working over about an hour, um, and, it, and, it, and luckily it worked. And so we're in a position where, you know, 13th of January, business peaks on the 31st. We are running across two different technologies, two different data centers, and our CIO phones us up and goes, right, let's turn off Skyscape for the first time in you know two and a half years. We managed to turn off one of the suppliers and, and rely slow, solely on our new supplier data center, and then is like, right, switch back. And it's easy as that actually now. You can just switch between the suppliers in terms of how much traffic you're putting through them. Um, and we generally run traffic kind of through them all the time, just to keep things lively. Um, so just to talk about our 31st of January, because like big business peaks are kind of in live ops. I feel like the biggest success stories are kind of always anti-climaxes, because the 31st of January was really, really boring for us. We didn't have to do anything. You know, we knew that we were resilient across data centers. We spent most of the time eating pizza and having land tournaments. And that's the kind of attitude, like the kind of thing you want to see on the 31st of January, um, which is something that's never really happened before, because normally we would be like absolutely bricking it. We have a lot of, um, we have a lot of sort of self-healing um, containerization. So it does kind of look after itself at the moment. And this kind of gives you an idea like Twitter, I always look at Twitter when we do the January peak. I've done two of them now. And like Twitter is great because if you look at previous years, this is this year, if you look at previous years, people are like, I can't log in, I can't log in. Now they're just, you know, having a go at the, the tax authority, which is awesome. I mean, that's what you want to see. People not actually not being able to pay their tax, just really annoyed that they had to. And in fact, there's some that we couldn't put up there. <laughs> yeah, that's 90% of them you can't put up. But yeah. Um, yeah. So thanks very much. And if there's any questions, far away. Yeah. When you, when you switch between the providers, in, in each of those providers, do they spin more infrastructure up, or do you have dedicated infrastructure that waits to be um, utilized? Yes. So we have dedicated infrastructure waiting to be utilized. So at the moment, we basically run double the infrastructure that the traffic actually needs. <laughs> Now, our plan is to, sorry, this just, we've complete, I completely forgot the demo. Yeah. So basically, this is the Kibana graph showing uh, the traffic between the two data centers. This is the live, all HTTP requests by data center for the digital tax platform, which now hosts the vast majority of HMRC's digital services. We took, flicked it over, when did you do it, Phil? Probably, yeah, so the problem, one of the problems is that Akamai takes 10 minutes to actually push out the changes. So. There's a slight delay. So we'll, as, as we talk, though, it will we'll keep watching. Yeah, we'll keep yeah it's going to look better. But as I say, yeah, so we have double the infrastructure footprint that we need. Um, one of the things we want to do is introduce a third supplier, uh, and then we'll reduce the footprint. Because we're assuming only one supplier out of three will fail, you know, we'll be running on 50% of the required amount each time. Yep. So we run a single cluster with one master. Generally, the master's in the data center, which is receiving the most traffic. And then when you switch it over, does it automatically fail over? What about a failover event? It doesn't, auto it doesn't automatically fail over. So the assumption is that if we have a data center failure, then you'll also get an election if you need one. Yeah, I think the missing piece of that puzzle is actually there is an AWS rollout as well, which has the arbiter node. So in a, the Mongo election's triggered, and it, it should actually be seamless. If there's a complete data center app, outage, it would be a seamless transition.
The issue is that generally that doesn't data centers don't tend to just disappear. Yeah. 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 So do you have any any mechanisms for monitoring performance and, and do actioning on performance? So you know, if we get really slow or you know, the other supplier gets really slow. Yeah, yes. we should say that one of the suppliers is basically the front row here, so <laughs> <laughs> So, yes, um, we've actually moved. Uh, yeah, we do. We have a lot of um, queries set up to look at stuff like uh, whether or not Mongo queries are slowing down. So, you know, looking at the databases. And also, if we hear stuff on uh, the government awesome. grapevine sometimes, because we have, a, you know, you hear like, oh, this supplier, something's happening over here. We'll just, as for safety, move across. Uh, so, we've done that before. But yeah, we have a number of basically. I uh, have a load of stuff set up in Sensu, and we're using PagerDuty. So as soon as we see any trouble, any other questions? Yep. So, do you think OpenStack's particularly suitable uh, for government? And also, how crucial do you think embracing open source is for like computing and government? So I think to I'll answer your second question first. So I think we have to go by the principle that we should open source everything that we can because our attitude is that the British people have paid for it, so they should get to use it. Um, I think, you know, in terms of us adopting other people's code that's been open source, it's the same argument as, as everyone else, the same advantages. Um, your first question, in terms of adopting OpenStack, we have requirements at different levels of our architecture, right? So right at the bottom of our architecture where we have the um, we have all of the information about every single person in the UK. That's stuff that we want to really, really protect. But at the front of our architecture, we have stuff, you know, really transient data, like someone's name, someone's email address, doesn't exist for very long, and maybe their session token. We don't need to protect that very much, and there's different requirements for different levels of security protection. Some we won't even have in a data center which isn't wholly uh, UK based, UK owned, and every single sysadmin is, you know, security cleared up to one of our highest clearances. And that's the, the huge mainframes, because we don't want people to interrogate, you know, public data. But then, realistically, if you're at the other end of that spectrum, um, you can look at companies which you know could be interrogated by foreign nations, uh, because it doesn't really matter, because what are they going to do with our information anyway? I think. So someone like AWS, right? AWS comes to the UK, we'll probably use them because there's no reason not to. I think the problem comes in that you need, and OpenStack's great for, in that reason, OpenStack's a great, um, great thing because we're now using like, a really good technology which we know is UK based and UK owned and that wouldn't have happened really. Like the, the experience we've had and kind of the story is about that not happening until this came along. Um, and we, can jump into things like public clouds, like AWS and Microsoft, but you know we're at the whim of the British public uh, in that, and they very, very quickly adjust their understanding of data sovereignty. So you know people didn't really understand what the uh, the US Freedom Act was about. They didn't understand what Safe Harbor was about, but you know five years ago. But now people have a much better understanding, and people. You know, is, is putting your data in an AWS database, in an AWS database, in an AWS cloud, going to be safe, even if it's UK based? You know, that's a, that's an interesting question, and it's interesting when you ask American companies who have UK owned data centers. And I think the public's understanding of what that means for their data gets better and better all the time. So we need to hedge our bets in terms of who, which providers, and which cloud technologies we can go with as we go through the coming years. One at the back. Well, actually, there's three other UK departments currently hosted on the tax platform. So we currently host uh, C uh, Civil Service Resourcing, uh, the Valuations Office Agency, and we've got a pilot with DWP. Uh, so yes, I do. I think different. I think we're probably the furthest along in terms of providing um, a platform. Uh, GDS are now building government as a platform, so that will be a healthy competitor to us because I don't think it's a good idea to put every single government uh, service on the same platform. But I think they'll either follow our leads, they'll either go to GDS to help them provide their, their um, PaaS, or they'll build one of their own. 
It depends on the requirements, I guess. I can also add a little bit to that. So the Home Office had uh, one of the avatar projects as well. I used to work on that. Um, GDS have driven this across all government uh, services, and there's a lot of interesting stuff happening. Yep. I mean, I'm not going to lie, we still have some big monolithic <laughs> like, horror shows, but yeah, this is, this, like I said, this, this, is the mo this is the best bit of HMRC, I guess, to work in. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I think a lot of it stems from the kind of from GDS, and they have a real, you know, the culture that they've built is one where instead of, is one where you have a lot more autonomy. So I think when we started this, we were given a, a load more autonomy to pick which suppliers we wanted and which tools we wanted. Um, and also we were, with that autonomy, you know, it's a great place to work. Right, HMRC, I think, previously on some projects where you had to go through like several patterns of governance to get anything delivered, it's not particularly exciting. And when it's not particularly exciting, you don't want to really take ownership and you don't want to be accountable for things. But actually, if you give people autonomy in an organization and say, look, guys, you can do what you want, but it's on you if it fails, but they're like, yeah, but I get to do what I want. And actually, I'm confident in my ability to deliver something. So maybe I'll pick a smaller supplier who's better because actually I believe it will work, rather than trying to buy myself a safety net by outsourcing all the risk to a massive supply. Can I just add something there as well, Tim? I mean, you know, the, the G Cloud purchasing framework that was put together in the UK was put together because the government felt that they weren't getting value from the historical kind of big procurement agreements that they, would get, that they had historically been in with companies like BT, Atos, Accenture, so the, the point of the G Cloud framework is to open up that, that um, the uh, ability to sell in the government to SMEs. Yeah, and that is actually a large, you know, we have we are we are trying as a government to you know use our purchasing power to grow, you know, the economy through SMEs by investing in decent SMEs. Uh, yeah. mm, do you know what, I've got quite, I feel like I'm quite blinkered in terms of what goes on in the rest of the government because I've got this thing to look after. <laughs> um, but I think it happens a lot in the digital area. Um, I think that still the attitudes that have been sort of nurtured there um, perhaps could be encouraged in the sort of lower down the stack when we're doing things with slightly more... Um, larger scale infrastructure problems. But yeah, I think it's, it's a good start. Any other questions? Cool, thanks very much. Thank you.